Amen. There is a timeless problem that exists that we really cannot avoid. And that timeless problem is sexual immorality. You cannot find a rock big enough to hide under to avoid this topic. It has been timeless in that from the beginning of the scriptures, from the beginning of time, we see people struggling with this matter. The antediluvians during the time prior to Noah had issues with this immorality. We see it with the Canaanites, the Greeks, the Romans, all through human history. It is an issue. And uh, all you have to do is turn on your television or the internet today, and it's still with us. Paul speaks to this head on in 1 Thessalonians. Thessalonica was a hub of immorality. There was temples, there was all sorts of pagan worship that involved sexual immorality. And he understood that this fledgling church that he was discipling and growing and nurturing was going to face this particular topic head on. So Paul speaks to it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. He tells us this, Finally then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that you received uh, from us instruction as to how you ought to walk and please God, just as actually do walk, that you excel still more. For you know what commandments we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification that is, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Oops. That each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God. And that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter, because the Lord is the avenger in all these things, just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. So he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Now as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. For indeed, you practice it toward all the brethren who are in Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, to excel still more and more. We'll stop right there. We have really three parts to this passage. We have the authorization, sanctification, and the juxtaposition. Paul opens this very difficult topic uh, with the, the idea here of walking to please God. And the notion of walking with God is really found as far back as the book of Genesis where Enoch walked with God. The idea is to have an intimate personal relationship whereby we obey, we, we listen, we trust, and we have a fellowship with God uh, that truly is remarkable and dynamic. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, 16 explains uh, how this transcends not only from the Old Testament but into the New. And it tells us here in Galatians 5, 16, but I say walk by the Spirit. Walk in step with the Spirit. Walk in touch with the Spirit. Be in contact with the Spirit and you'll not carry out the desire of the flesh. And then Paul goes on to implore uh, the church here on, on three different levels. He says, you know, I'm going to ask you, uh, I'm going to urge you, I'm going to instruct you. And he, he sort of uh, eases into uh, how he is presenting his, uh, his case. Uh, he asks kind of nicely. He urges with a little more force. And then finally he goes on to say, I'm going to instruct you like a military commander. <laughs> this is in Greek literally a term that would be used in the army when the sergeant major would be barking the orders and the troops need to get in line. And, and this is how he presents uh, this exhortation. When I uh, was graduating high school, the night of graduation, we had our, our commencement services and uh, you know, we all got our diplomas. And I went home for about an hour to spend some time with uh, my family. We were going to have a light dinner and I was going to go out with my friends for the rest of the night to a few parties. And I'm sitting at the dinner table and uh, my mother gives my dad the look. And uh, my father, he, he understood exactly where she was going and uh, he says to me, Dave, uh, I know you're going to be going out tonight. And uh, I want you to think about your choices. You need to make wise decisions tonight. Uh, yep, that I, I will. I, I got you. And um, about three seconds later, my father gets the look again. 
So my so he you know he ranks it, uh, ratchets it up a notch. He's like David, I I want you to think about your decisions and the choices you're going to make, and I want you to realize that those choices are going to have consequences on other people, perhaps. So you need to think about uh, the implications of your decisions. And I nodded. I I said yes, Dad. I I do understand about my choices and the implications. And uh, that didn't really work too well for Mom either. So Dad got the look for the third time. He she was then and and I knew it was coming and. And finally, about uh, a minute later, my father looks at me and he says, David, you are 17 years old and the drinking age in New Jersey is 21. I do not need to remind you, do I, that you will be breaking the law if you go out partying tonight. Yes, Dad, I thoroughly understand. So the, the progression came down the line and uh, that's what Paul's doing here. He's asking, he's urging, he's saying, this is what the law says because he understands as Timothy said in our call to worship, all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correcting, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate for every good work. Point number one, Paul is establishing before he says another thing, is scripture remains authoritative. And you've got to hang on to that. That's the foundation for about what he's going to share. That he's appealing to the authority of God's word. Nothing more, nothing less. Most churches have in their doctrinal statement some sort of language to the effect that we believe in the Bible. We believe that it is inspired, the plenary inspiration that all the scriptures. And normally there's some language in there to the effect that it is our final authority for both faith, what we believe, and practice. And we're no different. And this is what Paul is gunning for here. Point number one, the authorization. The second part, he is now saying, it is God's will that you should be sanctified. And he's appealing to the plan of God, the purpose of God, what God is looking to do in their lives. And sanctification really is a process whereby we are growing in holiness. It is not something that is avoidable. It is not an option. It is something that God has designed for those who are followers of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us very plainly uh, in the book of Hebrews that to pursue peace with all men and sanctification with which no one will see the Lord. It is an inescapable process by which we go, uh, whereby we slowly learn to lay down our lives, take up our crosses, and follow after Jesus. So what we find here is he's, he's laying out the goal, the purpose, which is to be holy because God is holy and that's what we're called to be. And then he goes on and he drops the hammer. He says this, that each of you should avoid sexual immorality. Now that word for immorality is poineia in Greek. It is where we get the word pornography from. You get porneia and then grapho, which is to write or to draw, and you put them together and that's where you get pornography. The word porneia in Greek carries with it the broadest possible scope of understanding and idea here. It involves adultery. It involves incest. It would involve rape. It would involve homosexuality. It would involve prostitution. It would involve any and every possible sexual act outside of the scope of a monogamous marriage between one man and one woman. And if you want to see how that outline flows, uh, your homework would be to read Leviticus chapter 18. It gives an entire list of all the thou shall nots. But it falls into that scope of anything and everything outside of the realm of a relationship between a husband and a wife in the context of marriage. We even see in the book of Deuteronomy the notion of adultery here. It's stated in the seventh commandment, but it also has another layer to it. In the tenth commandment, it's not just the act of being involved with somebody, but it's also the notion of coveting or desiring. It tells us in the tenth commandment, what? Thou shalt not covet what? Thy neighbor's wife, their goods, their manservant, their mace, female servants, anything. So we find here that there is not just the notion of committing an act, a physical act, but it is having that lustful desire within the heart, which also crosses a line. Jesus goes on to explain that even further 
when he is in, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, when he says, you know, you have heard what it says, thou shalt not commit adultery, but I say unto you, if a man looks at a woman lustfully, he has committed adultery with her already in his heart. So what we find here is that porneia is not only going to be the physical act, but it also could include pornography, and that's where I'm going with all this. The notion of having uh, a, a lustful approach toward uh, anything without even acting upon it, if that's being harbored within the heart, and we're stewing upon that, Jesus makes it clear uh, that we've already crossed the line. And what we find here is that Paul is recognizing this is a problem in the particular area of Thessalonica. Uh, we have, uh, there's uh, temple worship was common then, and in the various Greek temples, prostitution uh, was running rampant, both male and female prostitution. That was one of the major problems. He's also speaking to the issue of adultery. I wanted to give you a picture here of um, just how bad things were. The Greek influence during that time period uh, could not, cannot be understated. Um, there was a man by the name of uh, Aristippus of Cyrene. Uh, he is the father of what we call modern day hedonism. And uh, he had a philosophy that had permeated the culture starting in the fourth century BC and became very predominant. And this is what he wrote, uh, or this is the uh, summation of it. Uh, Aristippus the, of Cyrene, the father of hedonism, taught that the pursuit of pleasure was the highest good and noblest path one could pursue. In other words, if it makes you feel good, do it. And it doesn't matter what it is. This now becomes the marching orders for many who are in that philosophical camp, both on a religious level and on a personal level. It had gotten to such a point, the immorality during that day, that one of the attorneys, he is uh, an attorney and a statesman by the name of uh, Demosthenes, he writes this. We keep, uh, you got up there, we keep prostitutes for pleasure, we keep mistresses for the day-to-day -day needs of the body, and we keep wives for begetting of children and for the faithful guardianship of our homes. That's the mentality of first century Rome the empire, and it had permeated Judaism as well. In fact, when I was writing my dissertation, I came across a very unusual quote. There had been a couple uh, in what would be in Ephesus or modern day Turkey um, who wanted to be buried together. They had been married for 33 years uh, and they had a very healthy relationship and, and their final request was uh, after the wife had died, the husband was about to die as well. He wanted to be buried next to his wife and be remembered as a faithful man and everybody thought it was strange. They were surprised at this. <clears throat> the problem that we have here, especially with this particular culture, is selfishness. That a gift that God has given us has been flipped on its head and turned into an act that revolves around making me happy versus making someone else gratified. This sense of exploitation. And we see this especially in the fact that prostitution was so rampant during this day. I want to point you to a passage in Deuteronomy which really gives us a, 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 a picture as to what God intends physical relations to look like. It's Deuteronomy chapter 24 verse 5. It is for a newlywed couple. The Bible tells us this, when a man takes a new wife, he shall not go out with the army nor be charged with any duty. He shall be free at home one year and shall give happiness to his wife whom he has taken. The honeymoon was born in the Bible. The idea of having a break, having some time off. Notice the emphasis. It's not that the man will go home and figure out how to find pleasure himself. The emphasis is learning how to give, not to be on that selfish receiving end. And unfortunately, this is what the pagan culture of the day had flipped completely on its head, uh, defying what God had made to be something quite beautiful into something quite selfish. What we find here in the passage is that Paul is saying this, each of you should learn to control his body. And that notion of control here, the word in Greek, is something that will be used uh, with music or with sports or even art. It's mastery. The concept of mastering something. When you go out for a master's degree, you become what? Highly proficient in a given study. When people learn to play the piano, when people learn to play an instrument, when people learn to draw or to write, if they get involved with sports, you don't just wake up one day and become a fantastic athlete or musician. You may be 
born with a natural gift or proclivity. I happen to have a nephew uh, who's a professional musician. He's a singer. He's sung all over the world. He said at the Met, Philadelphia, Rome, London, you name the venue, he's been there. He was born with a natural gift, but he had to develop that gift over a long period of time. He was trained in high school, he went on to different camps, he went off to a choir college, he has been cultivating and developing that ability to sing and sing well in a choir over the course of at least 10 years now. He has mastery over it. Why? Because he's worked on it. He's invested time and energy and effort. And that's the same idea here when it comes to holiness. It is not something that just happens overnight. You don't just wake up and say, Lord, you know, I've got this pride issue. I've got this selfishness issue. I've got this, you know, immoral issue that's going on. And, and it's just going to get zapped from you. That's not how sanctification works. In fact, it's just the opposite. It is a long and slow and grinding road that is difficult, whereby moment by moment, day by day, step by step, we learn to submit to God's perfect will. And Paul is encouraging, urging, imploring through the authority of God that this is the pathway we must learn to take. We find here in the book of Corinthians a parallel exhortation. He says this, flee immorality. Every other sin a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is what? A temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own, for you have been bought with a price. Therefore, what? Honor God, glorify God with what? With your bodies. And Paul is saying here, and this, we find this topic cropping up throughout the entire corpus of the New Testament, that we have choices to make. And that choice involves worshiping God on a regular basis. It's not just on a Sunday morning. It's not just when we come here together. When you walk out the door, I mean, you could be living for Jesus at 1030 on a Sunday, and you could be living for the devil at 930 at night on a Sunday. It involve, life involves a series of significant choices that must be made. What you look at, what you think about, how you react to situations. I had a professor in seminary once say, you can't keep somebody walking down the street who happens to be attractive from being in front of you, but you can stop your eyes from looking at them again and what goes through your mind in terms of how you react to that person. And he was totally right. And I hear people, and, and, and I know where the objections are gonna begin, but, but my, I, I know friends who love each other. I know my doctor has said something, and the scientists have said this and this and that. At the end of the day, my question to you is this, and we go right back to the beginning. What is the final authority for you and I when it comes to faith and practice? Is it going to be the culture? Or is it going to be the Word of God? These are timeless truths that are being proclaimed here. These are timeless problems that people are struggling with. And I do not believe it is the culture that shapes how we approach this. Sadly, that has permeated the church. There are many within Christendom today who have rejected these ideas here because they want to embrace a more inclusive approach toward immoral behavior. And that's where I believe one of my professors and friends, Dr. Tom Constable, said it quite well. No appeal, Christi no appeal to Christian liberty can justify fornication. None. <laughs> We're not free to go out and sleep with whomever we want. It is just that simple. And what we find here is that as Paul is giving this exhortation, he reminds them that the Spirit is present in their lives. We are empowered and given the capacity to make good choices. Listen to what we find here in the book of Titus. Titus 2, 11 and 12. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. We have the resources. We have the word, we have the spirit, we have one another. We have the ability to live a righteous, holy life because otherwise God would not hold us accountable because it tells us throughout the course of scripture that we will be held accountable for every one of our actions. 
our motives, our desires, everything God is going to bring before his judgment seat. I like the way Rich Mullins, a uh, singer and songwriter years ago, described this journey that we go through. He says this in one of his songs, And on this road to righteousness, sometimes the climb can be so steep. I may falter in my steps, but never beyond your reach. And this is where I believe Christians come up with a lot of very lame excuses as to why we will either not obey God or we take on a much more legalistic approach. There's really two sides to this that I think Christians have approached the topic of sexual immorality, which I, I find to be uh, both unbiblical and very harsh. There's one where there's cruel judgmentalism. And there's another side where we just think everything is fine. We're just going to love people the way they are. End of story. Jesus loves you, but he doesn't love the way you are. I love my kids, but I don't love everything they do. And there's a separation, there's a distinction between that. And we can go about with compassion, and we can go about with care and concern, but still have disdain for sin. Because otherwise, what do we do? We're, we're acquiescing, we're saying it's okay to do whatever. Just fill in the blank, it doesn't have to be sexual. You can go out, punch your neighbor in the mouth. Go out and steal something. Go out and be proud. Go, go out and do whatever. If, if that's our mentality, then we will accept whatever behavior someone spoons for, toward us. And that is not God's will. It's not part of his plan. And that is why we find here, and need to be reminded sometimes, as Hebrews says, marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled. For fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Our second point, very simple. Believers must avoid sexual immorality. We must avoid sexual immorality on every level. But notice here, as Paul brings this particular pericope to a close, he doesn't just drop it with this final, okay, here's the authority, go do it. Notice what he says in the, in the following verses. I, I want to reread this for you. He explains to them that they need to remain holy. And then he says this, now about brotherly love. No, no, notice how that just gets dumped right in the passage. Now about brotherly love, we don't need to remind you uh, yourselves, uh, you've been taught by God to love each other. And I want to stop right there. Why did Paul take this passage about love and sandwich it right next to this very powerful exhortation about sexual immorality? Because there's a very unique juxtaposition that's taking place here. We have the authorization. Here's what God is saying. We have sanctification. Here's his plan for your life. And now we have this unusual juxtaposition because he is telling them once again, over and over, because he knows. He knows that this church is going to struggle in this area. He knows it because he's seen it in every other church he's been to. He understands what the culture is like in that day and age. He understands that there's prostitution. He understands that there's affairs. He understands that people are running around sleeping with one another. He gets it, perhaps better than anybody else. And he gives them this exhortation, you've got to stop this behavior. But on the same token, you need to have a level of love and compassion for one another. And this is where I think the legalistic side of Christendom misses the point. And what we find here is that love, when you really get down to it, is both confrontational and compassionate. Listen to what we find here in the book of Corinthians as love is being explained to us. Love does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. A loving person does not look at someone who is doing something wrong who's doing something clearly contrary to the scriptures and says, I love you so much, it's okay. That's not love. There, there's nothing loving about, nothing compassionate about that. I want you to think about John the Baptist for a moment. John the Baptist had one of the toughest ministries. He loved people. He was considered one of the greatest prophets, but he was also confrontational. Francis Schaeffer made it very clear the gospel is filled with compassion and love, but there's also a level of confrontation that accompanies it. John the Baptist confronted Herod. Over what? 
an affair. Herod was sleeping with his brother's wife. There was sexual immorality. And John continued to harp on him and tell you, you can't continue down this pathway. That's a loving response. He lost his head for it. Literally. But that was one of the most loving things that man could do. So we find here that love involves this notion of having gentle but compassionate confrontation. But it also involves a willingness to help people work through their issue. I want you to think about the prodigal son. The father, the inheritance, the young son gets a pot of money. He takes off. What does he do? Booze and broads, that's what it comes down to. He has a wild, he, he, he's, he's crossing all the wrong lines. Now, does the, father, does the father condone any of this? Not at all. But what's the father's response when the son repents? He welcomes him back. He forgives him. Because there's repentance and remorse. And he illustrates what the church needs to look like. There's that level of confrontation and conflict that does come because of sin. But there's also a side that's compassionate, that needs to be there. Because otherwise, we strip people of any sense of hope. That life could be different and life could be better. And life could be pure and life could be clean. And that leads us, it tells us here that you've been taught by God what this looks like. And that brings us me to an, another passage, very potent, and it's how Jesus handled situations. John 8, 1 through 11. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives early in the morning. He came again into the temple. And all the people were coming to him. And he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. And having set her in the center of the court, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. Now in the law of Moses, he commanded us to stone such women. What then do you say? They were saying this, testing him, so that they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down with his finger wrote on the ground. But when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and he said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones. And he was left alone and the woman where she was in the center of the court. Straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? <laughs> Did no one condemn you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go, from now on, sin no more. No condemnation, but no compromise either. He didn't say, just go on. He said, stop doing what you're doing. How does he strike this unusual balance? How do you have compassion without compromise? How does he strip this notion of condemnation away? The first issue here in this story is the fact that the, the accusation is being mishandled by the Pharisees. They're trying to trap him. You see, if they were really going to stone this woman to death, they're missing something. The dude. <laughs> the Bible was very clear that if you're going to bring somebody in for capital punishment, you needed two to tango. And he's not there. So they're setting Jesus up first and foremost. The second problem in all of this is the fact that they're missing the mission of the Messiah. She is clearly in the wrong. No one disputes that. The Pharisees, the witnesses, even Jesus. He accepts the testimony. She's crossed the line. He puts the trap aside, but we still have got the problem of this person. And the question is, why does he just say this? Why does he do this? Because the mission of Messiah was being missed by most people 
And we find even just a few chapters earlier in John, it's stated with such clarity, we could see why Jesus can show this com compassion without condemning her and yet still exhort her to leave and abandon her life of sin. John 3.16, famous passage, you almost all of you know it. What does it say? Here's Jesus' purpose. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. There's the rescue mission. That through Christ, through his death, through his resurrection, through his sacrifice, we can now have eternal life. But it goes on. Watch the next verse. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world. That also could be translated to condemn the world. But that the world might be saved through him. This is where we find Jesus saying, I'm not going to condemn because the mission was to save and to rescue. Take it one more step further. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Why doesn't Jesus need to condemn this woman? Is because she's already condemned. I want to explain it in this light. I'll wrap things up. If you ever go to Texas and somebody says, we're going to go to Huntsville, you're not going to think of a rodeo. You're not going to think of fruitcake. You're not going to think of the stockyards. When somebody says we're going to Huntsville, there's only one thing that's going to come to mind. Huntsville, which is a town about 70 miles north of Houston, is where they house prisoners on death row. It is in Huntsville, Texas that there is a prison, and in that prison is the death chamber. Texas carries out capital punishment. You have to commit at least two felonies simultaneously in order to be even considered eligible for the death penalty. It happens often down there. And when someone has gone through the entire trial process, if you have been found guilty in a court of law, if the evidence has been made clear and presented to the judge and jury, and you've been found guilty of two felonies, one of which would include murder, you could be sentenced to death. After that sentencing, you can go through your appeals process. Once the appeals have been rejected, if they are rejected, and you are still, on you are, you are still condemned to die, you are sent to Huntsville. People who are in Huntsville are simply waiting for their execution. They are guilty, they are condemned, and they are now on death row. This woman is on death row. You and I are on death row. Because all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And it tells us already that we stand condemned in God's holy courtroom. And because of that, there's no appeal process. There's no wiggling out of it. There's no being a good enough person. There's no morality. There's no religious boxes that we could check off. There's no way I could clean up my act and change it and turn things around in such a way where I could escape the condemnation. Every one of us is on death row. There's only one person who could reverse that process and grant clemency to a person who is on death row. It's not even the President of the United States. The President could, could grant pardons of all sorts, but that, those are federal crimes. The only, only one person in the state of Texas can pardon a person on death row, and that's the governor. The governor can do so because they have the authority to emancipate a person on death row. Jesus has the authority to emancipate people on death row. And that is why he is able to look at this woman and explain to her to stop sinning and to escape that condemnation which is already hanging over her head. 
And this is why we can too, my final point, display compassion without compromise. Because I don't care what sin it is. This may be an easy one for you. You, you. you may be walking just fine. But all of us have sinned. If you haven't broken one part of the law, you've broken another part. Whether it be your pride or unbelief, our selfishness or greed. You, you just fill in the blank. We've all broken the law. And every one of us is on death row. And the only escape that we have is through Jesus Christ. Because he has the authority. He has the ability. And he has the compassion and the willingness to set us free. And that's why Romans says, therefore, there is no condemnation for those of you who are in Christ Jesus. And all of God's people should be screaming, Amen! <laughs> because I'm no different than that woman, and neither are you. Jesus, the Son of Man, came to seek and save that which is lost. He comes with the authority. He comes with a plan of sanctification whereby we need to be clean and holy. And he comes by with compassion as well so that we could interface with a broken world that desperately needs to hear about him. There's no excuses for sin. But what we find is that if we walk by the Spirit, if we live by the Spirit, if we're empowered by the Spirit, we can slowly say no to sin because he gives us that strength to do so. And that is why the scripture says, the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. And there's no condemnation for us who are on death row. Let's pray.